This is The One Thing Podcast, and I'm your host, Dr. Adam Rindy. The One Thing Podcast brings together leaders in functional and naturopathic medicine to discuss actionable information that may unlock puzzles in the areas of gut health, brain health, metabolism, and longevity. Please note, these episodes do not replace the opinion of your doctor. They are not intended to diagnose or treat any condition. Please discuss this information with your provider and discuss your own unique personal health history before adapting this information. Please subscribe to our episodes so that you can stay on top of the most current information in these areas of medicine. Hey everybody, welcome back to this week's episode of the One Thing Podcast. I am so delighted to bring on my next guest, which is Julia Hollenberg. I've been wanting to speak with Julia for over two years on this podcast and we finally got together. She is a colleague in the Seattle area and is one of the most talented in our field. She is a food and body therapist, certified intuitive eating counselor, yoga teacher of 14 years, breathwork facilitator, and an endless explorer of the human inner landscape. She's passionate about helping people create a trusting and peaceful relationship to food and their body and to practice something called embodiment to experience more joy and richness and to kind of claim oneself as a sovereign being. We go into a lot of these aspects during the conversation, such as why it's so difficult to walk that path and also challenges people have, such as eating disorders, body shame, and other struggles that people have in coming from a place where they can connect with their body and their body's needs. And she has a number of dynamic viewpoints and really a rich understanding that's very textured and granular. This is not your everyday interview where you're getting answers that are cookbook or textbook. Julia has lived this path and it's really obvious from her answers and responses that she paints a real realistic picture and helps people get on a path that's more of a journey and a lifestyle and I was so inspired after listening to her and I'm so excited that a number of my patients work with her because they are in great hands. So I really hope you enjoy this interview. We go into so many facets that I think you'll walk away with an understanding of what it's like to enter a journey where you're connected with your body and embracing the connection between food and body and having a peaceful relationship with oneself. So without further ado, I welcome you to the next episode of the One Thing Podcast. Julia, welcome to the One Thing Podcast. It's so wonderful to finally get a chance to sit down with you. I've been wanting to do this for a couple of years now, at least. Oh, thank you so much. It's great to be here. Yes. And I know that we're both enjoying kind of a nice sunny afternoon here in the Seattle area. And I really appreciate you putting aside some time to speak with us today. Of course. So I, I think it'd be a great place to start to kind of understand your early memories of some of the work that you do, because you have a very eclectic practice tying in a number of different philosophies and, you know, on a foundation of nutrition and other aspects. And embodiment is sort of one of the things you're passionate about. And what are some of the earliest experiences you had of being like introduced to some of these approaches? Mm. Oh, it's really sweet to think back to some of those memories. And I feel really grateful for the upbringing that I had. I had wonderful parents who were present and it was just a really stable environment. And I feel really grateful for that. And one of my favorite stories, I don't know that I can say that this is an explicit memory, but my mom tells this story of me so sweetly of I was probably two or three or something like that. And in our house, the spice cabinet was on the lower part of the cabinets. So accessible to a little toddler. And I would open the spice cabinet and just take one bottle at a time. And my mom had them all alphabetized, unscrew the lid, smell it, and put it back and just kind of go down the line. And so I think this, I love this story. And I think it really speaks to this natural curiosity that I had for, well, natural curiosity in general, but also this affinity for the senses 
really wanting to explore through the senses. And to this day, I do enjoy cooking and I love, you know, herbs and spices and have a pretty good palate, like can pick out particular (laughs) ingredients in different meals. So that's a really fun memory that I can trace back this sort of affinity for the work that I'm doing now. And again, there were lots of wonderful things. My mom cooked dinner. We sat around the dinner table eating. And that was a really lovely part of developing my relationship to food. And I was always very active too. Lots of different sports. And it was always on a team, gymnastics, competitive cheerleading, volleyball. And that was wonderful. And yet when I look back at my movement experience, it was always around performing or competing in some way. So it was moving for a particular outcome, definitely to win or to get a good score or something like that. And so there wasn't necessarily this cultivation of how does it feel? What do you enjoy? Even though I did enjoy those activities for the most part. And so I can look back and see that that link of like to my inner world was missing. And for all the wonderful parts of my childhood. I also grew up in a household with a mother who was a chronic dieter. And so I really sort of witnessed and observed, absorbed that difficult journey for her. And it was never directed at me, but kids absorb a lot. And I think that I'm in the in the majority of people my age who had a mother who was on and off diets a lot. That's just kind of what was happening in that generation that was happening in culture. And so it's just not to place any blame, but to recognize that that was something that shaped my relationship to food and body. There was also a lot of weight stigma and fat phobia that I heard in my family. There were lots of medical professionals in my family. My dad was a physician. He's retired now. And so there were these little seeds being planted amongst the wonderful things. There are these seeds being planted that told me that I needed to watch my body, that I needed to be careful, that I couldn't gain weight. That would be the most terrible thing. And those were some of the seeds that sowed that sort of grew into a period of real disembodiment for me, like a lot of lack of connection. And I struggled with an eating disorder for a number of years throughout college and after. And so since then, it's really been a winding, interesting, difficult, rich, organic journey back to myself, back home to really an embodied state. Mm. Wow, that is a really interesting story. And it's so relatable in a lot of ways, you know, I'm sure for a number of people that are listening and and so real in that like you have this fondness and appreciation of your parents and, you know, the role that they played in your life. Um, yet you were impacted by the environment, you know, and the various messaging you were hearing. And even though, you know, there's obviously an affection and love for, you know, your parents. And it's just really refreshing to hear that, you know, there's sort of just both versus, you know, sort of this one story of, you know, this happened and it was because of this. And it seems like you've really done so much work on this and your understanding really shines. I love the memory of you smelling the spices. That's just awesome. (laughs) (laughs) There's this, I don't know if you know of this tradition, but in Judaism at the end of Shabbat, there's a service called Havdalah, where the end of the Sabbath, basically the last prayer, the last component before the Sabbath is over, there's like a candle lighting kind of ceremony. And then one of the last things you do is you smell spices to sweeten the upcoming week. Oh, how nice. Yeah. And so I instantly thought of that because it's a profound sensory experience to kind of, you know, have that olfactory kind of stimulus and and make an intention around it. Mm, Cool. (laughs) Yeah. So let's go further into this concept of embodiment. And I like your example of being an athlete and, you know, sort of being goal oriented and focused on winning and competing and not necessarily being in your body and kind of being aware of like how you were feeling in those moments. Is that kind of a lead into embodiment, kind of that dichotomy of what is embodiment? Mm. 
I'm happy to share from my understanding of it. And it's really, I can't tell you just how wonderful it is to be able to share with you about my understanding from an embodied perspective, because I think we like learn things cognitively and some, and then we like sort of repeat them, you know, as good students, we learn things. And then, so I want to share with you what I've learned and what I believe it is. Embodiment for me, as I understand it, as I feel it is using our bodies as a primary way of experiencing the world and our lives and of navigating the world and our lives. So we're sensing from the inside. It's an inside out approach, right? Sensing from the inside and regarding the body as a source of wisdom, as a source of knowledge that we can use to navigate our lives. And then we also can use it to experience and enjoy our lives. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Makes sense to me, you know, and it seems and this is sort of taking it in a direction, but I can bring me back if you need to. But it seems that this would come natural for some people and for other people, it would just be like really difficult, you know, because how long has one been disconnected, you know, from their body, you know, and it's almost like a strange land to enter into. Totally. Absolutely. I really think that so much of what we struggle with, and I'm generalizing here to sort of our, our culture. Yeah, our culture. I think so much of what we struggle with, we really have this crisis of disconnection. And, you know, there are any number of things that can create a disembodied state. So, you know, one of the things that I experienced was just a lack of cultivation of my inner world. I'm a very sensitive person and I feel a lot. And yet what was being encouraged of me was intellect and logic and thought. A lot of skills that have made me successful in the sort of outside world, the outward facing world, but uh, sort of a stranger to my own inside world of intuition and emotion. And I work primarily in my work with people with eating disorders or disordered eating, any form of disordered eating. And when someone is struggling with an eating disorder, that is a fundamental state of disembodiment. Whatever the pattern is of eating or moving, it is an overriding of the body's signals, a misattunement and overriding or an avoidance perhaps of what's happening in the body. And so that, you know, that's difficult. It's difficult to heal from that. Not impossible. I also think, you know, there's actually such wisdom in disembodiment as well. And it's so important to me to really honor the parts of ourselves that feel difficult or that feel like they're holding us back in life in some way. When people experience some difficulty or experience trauma, it can be a survival mechanism to disassociate from the horrific pain, be it physical or emotional, that's happening in the body. And that dissociation is protective. It's survival. And so, you know, for people who are struggling with embodiment, like there may be a very, very good reason why that disconnection happened and why that struggle is there. And I think it's important to really honor that. I think that's a great point. And I think knowing that is comforting for people who are you know, sort of identifying with the fact that they might be disconnected from their body or that they do that as a kind of a protective mechanism. I mean, there could be deep seated trauma and experiences that are really scary to access. And so. And it makes the body feel like an unsafe place, right? It literally doesn't feel safe to sort of land and feel and use the body, as I was saying, as a way of experiencing the world. And so like, energy goes right up into the head. Like, let's use the brain, let's use the head and become very, you know, centered in the head. And there's a disconnection. And again, that can be the body's way of accessing safety. Yeah. You know, and intellect, it's in a sense, it's so accepted as being kind of a mode if, you know, if and embraced and encouraged. And then, you know, when someone's coming from a space of like full connection and intuition and awareness of their body, they might feel that, you know, sort of 
they need some type of checks and balances system and kind of go right back to the intellect as being the ruler of their kind of sense of being. Yeah, I, I, it's so common. I mean, I have experienced that in my own life and I see that in the clients that I work with as well. When we start to, you know, work on intuitive eating, it can feel like you've swam out into the middle of the ocean and you can no longer see the shore. And it's like, there's no ground under your feet. You can't see land. And it's just this sort of can be, be like this unanchored feeling. And that there can be a real urge to grasp back onto the rules <laughs> that eating disorders provide or that diets provide. So yeah, there's a lot of discomfort and a lot of unknowns in that process. And I think for just knowing that being able to explain that feeling is really important because, you know, it's like not knowing that there's going to be when you first enter into this space, not knowing that there's going to be that feeling of like lack of boundaries around you and sort of this kind of I'm swimming sensation or a perception of that, that it could, you know, knowing that you might experience that and that's a possible process that you need to, you know, that you would be going through is probably helpful. You know, it's kind of like if someone is trying to make a change or trying to grow as a person and they're aware that the roadmap might involve these stages and that's to be expected, then it makes it easier to navigate. A little bit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's well said. I think the, I guess starting out in kind of the beginning stage of this, can you talk a little bit more like other things about this process that makes it so difficult? You've already mentioned a lot, but I'm just wondering if there's anything else that you hear, you know, that's like a common, common feedback you get from people you work with or from your own journey. That makes embodiment feel difficult. Yeah, just makes the, you know, kind of the embodiment process difficult. Yes. Well, I may answer that in a bit of a roundabout way. And what's really arising is recognizing the patterns or the sort of symptoms of a disembodied state or what that could look like in our lives or feel like. And so when we are disconnected from our body and the energy and the sort of locus of our attention goes up into our minds, it's really common to feel like you're over intellectualizing things or you might you people say I can't get out of my head or my thoughts are spinning or you know that's a version of anxiety right there's anxiety and there can also be this pattern of looking outside of yourself right? constantly looking outside of yourself for the answer right and in my world it's the diet plan of what to eat right look to someone else for what to eat and how to eat the right way so it's a sort of looking out everywhere in the world to other people like, oh, they must be doing it right. This must be the right plan. Looking everywhere other than within. And that causes a lot of anxiety and a lot of fear of like, am I going to make the right decision? I don't know. I don't know how to make a decision. Because from a disembodied state, our inner locus of agency our grounding, our connection to, well, agency is, I think the best way to say it, is buried. It's still there. It's just buried or atrophied as the pattern has been to really think and overanalyze and try to figure out the right way of doing things. And I think there can also be, from a felt sense, a sense of lack of juice in life. That's my official term, juice, meaning it might just feel that sort of buzz of anxiety and some fear, but without the sort of full range of experiencing human emotion. So from a disembodied state, we're doing our lives, but not experiencing our lives. And yet, because living in the mind is so conditioned, right, we see the intellect in our culture as supreme. We see it in the way that you know, education systems are set up. We see it in the way our medical systems are set up and even our religious systems in that, you know, the mind is sort of supreme and the body is viewed as an obstacle or if we're talking about religion, sinful, you know, we want to transcend the body. So there's all sorts of cultural messaging that makes it really difficult to start to do the work of deconditioning 
operating from the mind and starting to reattach our connection to the body's wisdom. Can I say one more thing about that? I feel Um, like there's one. (laughs) Oh, absolutely. (laughs) Yeah, I think the other thing as it relates to body image, right? We are whacked upside the head from every direction around the way that I'm just going to say a woman's body since that I've worked primarily with women, not exclusively. And I am a woman. So that's how I've experienced the world. We are just bombarded with messages about the way that our body should be in order to be loved or accepted or feel included or healthy or to just be okay. And that norm, the cultural norm is very narrow. And so when a person has an experience of falling outside of that norm, there is this disconnection that happens, this divide and this feeling of my body is not okay. It's not good enough. And it is an act of absolute rebellion for a person who doesn't fit that cultural norm of what a body should look like according to our beauty standards and diet culture to say, I refuse to believe that message. My body is good. I am worthy. It's really radical. And it's very difficult to reject the cultural messages and start to really come into a sense of empowerment in one's own body. Yeah. Yeah, it sure is. Like, you know, I think about all the people and the pain and suffering that people are going through and this kind of internal, just, you know, kind of day-to-day hell, you know, going through trying to live up to whatever that is. And it's heartbreaking. And to know like 20, 30, 40, 50 years could go by where every day is that existence. Yeah. So deeply ingrained. So deeply. Yeah. And to know that like there's this alignment that can happen, you know, of what you're talking about, where your frame of reference can change to who you are and to love yourself in that way, to stop looking for to become someone else or to compare to someone else. I mean, ultimately, like, you know, that's such a on so many levels, that's so profound, because what can come from that philosophy is much, much more than sort of appearance or, you know, body weight, it's doing can align you with your purpose, right? Yeah, it's an affirmation of the self at a really core level rather than a rejection. And I think, you know, that's one reason why I am so passionate about embodiment work is because it really starts to shift the conversation and shift the focus away from body image, which is largely about appearance, right? How do I feel about how I look? And usually that's compared to some idealistic image, idealized in quotes, right, according to culture. And it really, because, you know, I find that's usually a losing battle, trying to get to a place where you feel really good about how you look, because it's so fickle. It's so fickle. You know, our body goes through changes. We're all getting older. Our skin's getting saggier. You know, it's all happening because we're living, changing organisms. And so the pursuit of being happy with body image and how you look is really unsteady ground. And I think it's great, you know, for people who do have that sense of like, yeah, I like the way I look today. That's great. But that's not the focus, right? So that's where the embodiment work comes in, where we get to just shift. It's like turning 90 degrees and shifting our focus to viewing the body as a vessel, as an instrument, as a way that we experience our lives. And what is there to delight in? What is there to appreciate? What is there to notice about how you experience the world through this body. And then it starts to get super interesting. I bet. Yeah, I bet the world becomes um, extremely more tactile and more textures and more colorful. And, you know, it's sort of more alive. Is that the case? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's been my experience in my embodiment journey. It's like, And I want to say, too, that sort of when we're talking about embodiment, we're really thinking about our sense doors, you know, opening up our senses to experience. We're also talking about our emotions, right? feeling our emotions and also our intuition. So absolutely, absolutely. It can really bring a vibrancy to 
life through these really tiny moments that we were completely overlooking before because we were looking in the other direction, trying to contort ourselves and our bodies into something that it's not meant to be and feeling really frustrated and angry about that. Yeah. Makes me think of getting to a place where you're coming from such a deep sense of trust that, you know, your awareness of your environment, you're trusting it, you're trusting how you're being and the senses that your perceptions and the information you're accessing versus this side of you that's like, you know, the inner critic or the pessimist that's sort of keeping you from like fully being. Mm -hmm. Yes. Trust is really the word that I picked up out of what you said. And it's so important and so, so difficult. And I want to put this into perspective for people because I know that you know, based on my own experience, the journey is long. And so I want, I want to put this into perspective. So I struggled with my eating disorder for six ish years, like with the sort of overt symptoms and and behaviors of an eating disorder. And it's been, let's see, how can I say this? So that was 14 years ago. So it's been 14 years for me where I really feel like the signs and symptoms of an eating disorder, you would say were resolved healed, right? In recovery. And yet the relationship with my body and the sense of building self-trust has taken so much longer than that. And it's really just in the last few years that I've done some really deep and intensive work around this that it's starting to really land. And it's so exciting for me. And wonderful. And I do feel like my life has really come into full color. And it's all from, it's not because like big things happened in my external world that I feel happy about. It's all the relationship to the inner world. And I just wanted to share that because trust with oneself takes so long to build. And it's just a long organic journey. And to expect that it's going to come in your first one or two years of being on this journey or of healing your relationship to food and body is, you know, not really realistic, but yet it will feel that way because you keep just accessing deeper and deeper and deeper layers of it. And so it feels really good every time you do get to a new place of like, oh yeah, okay. I feel like I can trust that now. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad you kind of paint that realistic kind of overview of someone who's lived the journey and, you know, has been on this path because that's really helpful. And I think, you know, really, if someone is sort of just dipping their toes into this and I think making steps towards a different way of being with yourself, you know, even just being on that trajectory can be so exciting, you know, like you might, you know, you to just know that you've found a way to embrace yourself and it's going to take time and it's going to be work, but it's a direction that is coming from a place of love of self and, you know, honoring of self and a lot different than sort of scrolling Instagram, looking for the next solution, you know, for something that you perceive is wrong with you. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, I think that I've experienced that personally, you know, where, where, something is kind of like a breakthrough idea and just moving in that direction alone. There was so much energy behind it, even though I knew that I was just starting. (laughs) Yeah. And it just feels, talk about a body sense when you know you're on, can you share about like some of the things that you've experienced when you know you're on the right path or when you know that you're aligning with sort of yourself in a way that feels authentic? Yeah, that's a good question. And there's this experience that's coming to mind that could seem insignificant, but for me, it feels very significant. So after I graduated from my undergrad and moved to New York City and was living there for a few years before I moved to Seattle, and that was a time where I was still sort of intermittently engaged in in my eating disorder. So it was still very present for me. And I found my way to yoga. I was having sort of an emotional crisis and there was just this overwhelming sense of needing to channel my energy into something positive. And so I started going to yoga and I hopped around to a few different studios and found a teacher who I really liked. And being in her class, it was just 
you know, in the physical movements, because of my background with sports and gymnastics and things like that, the physical movements felt resonant in my body, you know, it felt good, but there was something else. It was like this little shimmer of something that I felt inside and I didn't know what it was, but it was just pulling me in that direction of like, I need to follow this and investigate it more. And so I did. I signed up for yoga teacher training. Having only practiced yoga for six months, it was that sense of like, I need to be immersed in this. I need to really, really investigate and find out what this sort of, it was like something that makes you sit up and widen your eyes. Like, what's that? You know, I want to know more. And so I think that feeling of curiosity and this sense of wanting to lean in and know more, like that is one way that I think our body can let us know like, hey, that direction. And the real part of the story that I wanted to share (laughs) is that as I was in yoga teacher training and, you know, practicing yoga multiple times a week, I was also running, right? So running was the form of exercise that my eating disorder told me that I should do. So I'm doing both at the same time. And because I had started practicing yoga, I started to make these links in my felt experience that, oh, when I go running, if I practice yoga that day or the next day, my body feels very tight, like rigid, like locked up in a way, especially my hamstrings. And so I really started to make this link and I wanted to have more freedom and flexibility in my body. And I knew that was my natural state. And it was that, it was being on my yoga mat and being encouraged to notice what was happening inside. There's a tenet in yoga philosophy called Svadhyaya, which is self-study. So this is a very central thing that we do in yoga. We go inside and we study our own experience. And that allowed me to make this link of what was happening in my body as a result of these different types of movement. And that's the thing that allowed me to let go of running. It was the sense of, oh, I want to move in this direction. And so I'm going to let this other thing go. It was not an overt, I need to do this for my recovery. It was just this sort of this intelligence and this wisdom coming from below. If you could see my hands, I'm gesturing to like, sacral area, like pelvic area, like coming from below of like steering me in the right direction for my well-being. So that was a really profound experience for me. You know, I think these experiences are things that when one experiences them, it's something that you have to learn to own and not question, right? And not have to run it by other people or I mean, part of the journey is just getting to that place of yes and believing it. I agree with you. And there's a whole bunch of messy middle where there is so much second guessing. It's normal, right? So for people who are like, wait, I question myself all the time. It's normal. I've certainly been there and still am there in some ways, in some arenas. But that sense of trust grows stronger and deeper each time we choose to not second guess ourselves. But I think what I wanted to share about that is... how about this? Yeah, go ahead. To add into that, being comfortable with that uncomfortableness. Oh, Adam, you hit the nail on the head. So yes, and we human beings do not like discomfort. We don't like ambiguity. We don't like discomfort. And I think that's partly why the body is this kind of scary place is because there can be a lot of enjoyment and pleasure, but there can also be a lot of discomfort when we start to tune in to the body. And, you know, when we step onto the path of saying, I want to feel more connected, we're actually signing up for whether we know it or not, the pleasure and the pain, the joy and the sorrow, right? The ease and the dis-ease, right? The discomfort. So we get it all. We don't get to pick and choose actually. And so embodiment is really about embracing the fullness of our human experience. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I think that's exceptionally said. I mean, it's just, I think people are really getting blessed with your words right now because it's so easy. And I think it could plug into previous structured beliefs of saying like, well, if I just do this, everything's going to be okay. Or, you know, that I'm kind of going back into another extreme way of looking at something versus you kind of painting the picture of all the different textures and the realness of like the full experience of pain, sorrow, joy is it makes it so real, you know, and makes it so something like 
that gives a person permission to be human through this and not feel like this is just another thing that I need to do right. Yeah, that's such a beauty of embodiment and of, you know, it, the intuitive eating journey. It's about reconnecting to yourself. And there's no way that you can do it wrong. Because what it is, is looking at your experience and feeling your experience. And that's it. Like, it's not wrong. It might be uncomfortable sometimes. And it might be amazing at times. But you can't do it wrong. Yeah. And, you know, it seems like it breaks negative cycles and just kind of puts you in a process of living versus like, a cycle of trying to get it right. Did I do it right? Did I get there? Did I achieve the goal? No. Okay, what can I do better? <laughs> you know, this kind of cycle, we see these patterns in our lives. But you know, what you're describing is to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, is more of like, just a way of living, being a lifestyle approach, a philosophy of life. I totally agree with you. I love that phrase, or the word process, right? So embodiment allows us to enter into the process of living which by nature means everything's changing all the time. And so we can't cling too tightly to any one thing or any one state or any one circumstance in our life because it's all changing. And when we do the work of becoming connected to ourselves, it's sort of like we become like an empty boat riding on the waves, right? So life, there are always waves, right? And from an embodied place, we can sense where there's a swell and we can listen and we can adjust. And then there's an ebb, you know, so it allows us to dance and move with life, with the ups and downs in a way in which we're not fighting ourselves or fighting life. And so, you know, life is difficult, but at least, you know, from an embodied place, we can remove that added layer of difficulty of fighting, fighting life. So along those lines, what about relationships with people who aren't on this path and how, you know, that in life events and other things that kind of pull away, how do you navigate that? You know, so for example, you know, there's a parent that needs you to be their caregiver or things, big events happen. And it's kind of like, I mean, at least in my experience, for a lot of people, they just give up their own needs and just kind of put their own stuff on hold. And which, you know, we don't have to kind of debate whether that's one way or the other. It's just that would be a threat to someone who's embracing sort of this process of embodiment. And, you know, I'll give you an example, you know, just like staying up all night by the, in the hospital to help someone or you know, and then going back, you know, say if it's a long illness or, you know, going and helping someone who's in need and you're putting your own needs aside, which are, you know, honorable acts in, in a lot of ways. But at this point, there may be sort of this disconnect that kicks in again. How do you talk to people about those kind of life quakes? Mm, yeah, it's an interesting question. And so when we think about balance, it's not a steady state. It doesn't mean that everything is comfortable and nice all the time, right? So there are waves, like we were just talking about that analogy of the ocean, right? there are waves. And I think, you know, the question that helps me anchor into an embodied state is to ask, how is it now? And in that example that you gave, that question of how is it now could be okay, I am willingly entering into a giving position where, you know, I'm going to be sleep deprived, I'm going to be tired. And this is a wave, right? Maybe if there's an unpleasantness to it or a difficulty emotionally and physically. So that might be a part of the answer of how is it now, right? What is my life circumstance presenting for me to navigate? That answer to that question of how is it now could also be, it's important for me to support this person. I want to be there, but I can't do it alone. So how do I bring someone else into here so that I can get a good night's sleep or so that I can take a couple hours for self-care or whatever it might be? So yeah, that question of how is it now for me really helps to clarify, bring clarity and honesty to what is happening both in the external circumstances of our lives, but also in our own internal worlds as well. Mm. That's beautifully said. It, it gives me a sense of like fluidity and life 
you know, and the opposite of that would be a sort of like a firm rigidness of feeling like you can't give that because it would threaten control or a sense, which I think is a big problem a lot of people struggle with is, you know, needing their routine, needing their structure, needing. But I, I love how you say, you know, just sort of identifying and then also being aware enough to know that you might need some help and assistance. And so you don't completely abandon that side of you that needs to have that sense of balance. Yeah, I think one of the gifts of embodied living is being able to be connected to ourselves and also connected to others at the same time and to have a wisdom of when to move into more connection and when to move into more solo time. If we don't have that connection to our own body and our own needs, it becomes really difficult to do that and we can get exhausted and resentful and anyway, so, and it's imperfect. It's a flow. It's very imperfect. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So when you're interacting with people and they're sort of new to this world of what are some of the early things that you'll hear, like with someone who's sort of wanting to kind of dip their toes into becoming more embodied or, you know, becoming, moving in this direction. Like, I imagine there's a continuum. Like, what are some of the more kind of beginner kind of stages of all this? Yes. I've never had a client come to me and say, I want to be more embodied. <laughs> <laughs> Those were my words. <laughs> I know. I know. But I think it's important to say, you know, that the language, you know, what I normally hear is, I want to feel more comfortable in my own skin, or I want to feel more at peace. I want to feel more ease. There's a battle going on inside of me all the time, and I'm exhausted from it. Things like that would be what I'm normally hearing. And I think that relationship to food and body, you know, it's been my own path. And I happen to think it's this beautiful and perfect portal to open into the world of embodiment and reconnecting mind to body. It's not that the mind is bad. It's just that we need, they need to work together, right? Become integrated. And so some beginning steps, and I would say to go back to what we were talking about with trust, right? There is a general sense of like, I do not trust myself. I do not trust my body. And it's such an honor for me to be able to sit in that space with people and be a person that is almost like a proxy for trust in their body. So that's really what I see as my central role is supporting people in rediscovering, right? Discovering or rediscovering trust within themselves. And like you said, that can be really, people can second guess a lot. And so that's part of my role is to point out the ways in which their body is actually right on cue, like right on target. And can you lean into that? So some of the things that we might start off with in the beginning stages are, what do you like to eat? What flavors are pleasing? And, you know, so this idea of interest or delight, and sometimes we'll even talk about it in things that seem a little bit more peripheral, like what kind of clothes do you like? <laughs> there could be so much focus on what looks good on me that we forget to ask ourselves, what do you like to wear? What is your style? It can also feel pretty overwhelming for the beginning of an embodiment journey to be listening inward, right? Especially with trauma history, it can feel like just a lot to start to go in. And so meditation is not the first place that we start or that I would recommend starting uh, for a number of reasons, but things that allow us to engage in the outside world. So a really basic brief grounding practice that we might do is to just start the session by feeling our body sitting in the chair. That's all, right? To feel, to feel the back of the chair against our back body, the, pre the sensation of pressure, right? So there's a sensory input pressure to feel the seat of the chair underneath the legs, just orienting down into that felt sense. Those are some of the little, you know, beginner pieces. Yeah. That's really helpful to kind of hear the sort of a tangible example of that process with the example related to food, kind of identifying like, what do you like to eat? And what when you're kind of going into that realm, 
is it sort of hard for people to just really be authentic with like, you know, I want some French fries. I want, you know, whatever it is that they're, you know, kind of sensing, like, how does that conversation go? Is it just sort of like, you know, kind of a, being an awareness or, or does it kind of inform you of more kind of about what a person's needing, like their relationship to food? I, can you give more examples of that? Yeah, you know, it's so individual. And some people have never been asked that question or have never really contemplated it because there's been just years and years and years of the shoulds and the shouldn'ts around eating that the question of desire or preference doesn't even come into the equation. And so sometimes it's just like, what do you mean? What do I like? And there's not a reference point yet in the body to be able to answer that question, but that's okay. Right? The point is to ask the question and to just orient in that direction to whatever degree is possible. So yeah, you know, we bring in that question and inevitably the food rules and the shoulds come in and that's okay. That's part of the process. And as I work with people, I constantly just gently redirecting back in the direction of the body, what the body thinks and feels, what the body wants, what the body needs. And in that way, it's like, my guidance becomes an advocate for their body, like a voice of their body to start to consider that perspective, which can be brand new for a lot of people. Yeah. I have a smile on my face because I'm just thinking of people that that you've worked with over the years that I've known, like that I've referred to you or you've referred over to me. And I love just hearing them talk about food and their process that they've been with going through with you because there's an energy around it that's sort of light and playful and sort of kind of I'm okay with what I'm doing. And there's not like a shame energy that comes through. Like I'm all for that and love that because I love people's just being authentic. And there's nothing that good comes out of long term out of my experience of being hard on yourself or thinking that you should be doing it differently. It's just like, this is what I'm doing right now. This is what I'm cultivating. And I see that with your patients really great and just like the lightness around food. And it's just really a pleasure to work with. Mm, Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, I agree with you. I don't think there's any good that comes from, you know, hanging on to shame and shoulds around food. And in fact, you know, that brings, that elicits the stress response in our bodies. And we know that the stress response negatively impacts our health, um, every aspect of our health. And so such a big part of this work is actually removing some of those stressors so the nervous system can get a bit of a break, at least in this department, and physical and mental health really improves when stress is lower. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I also want to say too that I I want to return the compliment, Adam, (laughs) (laughs) that what I hear from my clients who see you, they just feel so heard. They appreciate the spaciousness and the time. And there's a real sense of care that they walk away from after seeing you. So very grateful to you. Thank you. Yeah, that's great to know. I just feel like when my patients are kind of at a place where they're connecting with the energy and the sense of self-care that you're talking about and self-embracement, like my job is pretty much, I feel like at that point, they're on their way to being like their own physician. (laughs) It's like from that point of where you're really honoring yourself and your mental health and your self-care and that self-love, it's like a really good sign of health overall. So I'm always excited when people are working with you because I just know there's a good path ahead. But thank you for the compliment. So you're going into helping people sort of through retreats and you know, you've expanded your practice into kind of more of intensive experiences with people. Can you talk about the retreats you're doing and sort of what goes on on those retreats? Yeah, well, this is a new venture for me. And I have been cultivating and sort of incubating, I suppose, how to really weave together my worlds of food and body therapy as a dietitian, and also my love of more embodiment practices like yoga and breath work. 
to really combine those together because I think nutrition therapy is not enough. You know, the embodiment practices create all sorts of side doors and paths into the process of healing. And that's really exciting to me. So where I'm headed in a not so linear concrete fashion, but (laughs) this is where my desire and sort of intuition is bringing me as really wanting to weave together these different offerings, these different parts of who I am as a provider. And so I'm hosting an embodiment retreat in the first weekend of August in Bend, Oregon. And it's a two and a half day experience. And the invitation is, it's a small group, it's a women's retreat. And the invitation is to step into a space where we are practicing bringing our locus of attention down into the body. And there's like a whole buffet of different things that we're going to do from some gentle yoga, some breathwork practices, eating, right? We're going to eat together. So there's intuitive eating part as well, engaging with nature, and then the community connection as well. And it's all the container is really going to be set to continually reorient toward the experience of the body and embracing, as we were talking about before, the full experience, whether it be lovely and pleasant or whether it be kind of uncomfortable. And I also, you know, there's such power in getting groups of people together to share and support one another. So, you know, I don't know what it's going to turn into. It's going to be its own organism, the group dynamic, but I feel really confident that there's going to be something magical that I can't plan for that just comes from gathering a group of women who are intentionally wanting to cultivate this embodied connection to themselves and their lives. Yeah. And when they return from the retreat, will there be some way of continuing to be in contact, like as a community or to connect with others? Is that part of it? I'm not sure. I mean, I suppose that could be a conversation, not planned, but it's a nice idea. Yeah. I've had that experience personally. I wouldn't have gone to retreats where when we got back, we just kept in touch with some people in our local area just to kind of like remain connected and continue to share things that you experience. It's, it was helpful. I'm sure it's not for everybody, but it was good for me. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for the idea. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I think, you know, we've really gone through a lot today and I really appreciate you hanging there with some of my questions and, you it's know, a just, delight. <laughs> yeah, there's so much to this and I think, you know, it can continue to kind of grow as in a discussion because I think the world, you know, we no longer are sort of have blinders on, you know, how energetic our bodies are and, you know, how, you know, our breath influences us and all breathing mechanics and our sense of connection of our holistic organism and how important that is to, you know, kind of have that integrated. And I mean, this conversation can grow and I hope that we can get back together sometime again and keep talking about this. On that note, if there's anything like closing words that you could share with us, that would be great. Otherwise, you've shared so much wisdom. (laughs) It's been plenty, but if there's anything else that you want to leave us with, please do. (laughs) I think what's arising is that if you have any sense, speaking to listeners, right? If you have any sense that there is some longing for something more in your life, I would bet money on that the answer is inside rather than outside. And so that sense of dis-ease of like, I'm missing something or longing for something or maybe feeling like you're existing but not living, that is usually a call to step onto the path of embodiment. And it's your path and one path for one person, no one else has mapped it out ahead of you. So there's no wrong way to do it. And to just start. And I'm partial to yoga. I think a yoga practice is really powerful container to start to explore connecting to the inner world. It's not the only one, but I think it's a really good one. And you just kind of follow the breadcrumbs and it's mysterious and it's unclear. And that's part of it. And I've had to make peace with that, which was not easy, you know, but it's not meant to be clear. It's meant to be this like bit by bit unfolding of 
the journey of coming home to oneself. Well, wonderful. It sounds like a very worthy adventure. (laughs) And (laughs) I hope people will join your retreat and continue to kind of learn from you because you are just a real gift. And, you know, I think a lot of people don't speak to the granularities of things like you do. You know, they can kind of organize it in a very like concrete way, but you you have all the textures and granularities of your expertise. And that's just really special. So thanks again for being here and look forward to future conversations. Thanks so much, Adam. Pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for tuning in to this week's episode of the One Thing Podcast. Please share these episodes with your friends, loved ones, colleagues, patients, healthcare providers, anyone who you feel might benefit from hearing these informative interviews. We tend to learn best from people sharing things with us. That's often the first time it's introduced. So don't hesitate if the content of these episodes reminded you of someone that might benefit. Forward the the episode to them and I'm sure they'll either appreciate it or be appreciative that you've thought of them. So once again, we'll look forward to seeing you next episode on the One Thing Podcast. And again, much appreciation for you being here with me.